But the scripture makes it very clear, for by grace you're saved through faith, not of works. And if you put this emphasis on baptism that it brings about a regenerative experience, then you're saying it's the action, it's the work of baptism, not the belief. Good morning, Pastor Jameson. I thought you were going to say, good morning, Vietnam. <laughs> that was a good movie, though. Wasn't bad. No, Robin Williams was pretty funny. So, Well, how are you this morning? Man, I'm wet. Like, You're wet? We seriously almost just pulled off in Williamstown and hopped on the Ark and drove it on down. <laughs> I don't know if you, dri- you don't drive the Ark, but you know what I mean. Yeah, it's kind of a yucky, rainy day. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple nice days, but today's kind of yucky. I'm... Yeah, I'm kind of dragging myself this morning. I had trouble getting started this morning. I didn't sleep great. Well, I I did, but I didn't. So it was like so I read right before bed, and and I usually read on my Kindle because it's got the dim light, so I don't have the whole blue light thing going on. Um, and I'll often just fall asleep like while I'm reading, and that happened last night. But I slept really hard, and then I woke up. Like I woke up, and I was like, oh man, I bet the alarm's about to go off. And you know, I slept hard and good and it was like 2 30 and then I couldn't go back to sleep and so I'm just laying there thinking like almost like a brain dump like everything was just, I was just having these crazy thoughts on weird stuff like I went down this whole rabbit hole a uh, hole of sodas that like were around when I was a kid that aren't around today like, I spent probably 15, 20 minutes thinking about this. Like, Well, RC Cola's still around, so that wasn't one of them. No, but like Tab. Tab. And some of these may still be around. I just don't ever see them anymore. Yeah. But, like, remember all of the – you ever, did you ever drink a Tab? That was the nastiest. Was nasty. <laughs> and my mom used to drink Diet Right, which I think is still around. I but, think so. I don't know. And all the, the crushed flavors. You have to go to, like, these exotic stores to get them, like Jungle Gyms in Fairfield, Ohio, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, they're – well, I had a buddy who used to drink Jolt Cola. Do you remember Jolt? I remember the name. I never tasted it. It was like a precursor to the Red Bulls and the Monsters. But, I mean, this oh. stuff was like a can of sugar and caffeine with a little <laughs> bit of maybe carbonated water in it. I mean, you it, you could drink it, but I think you kept cans in your car in case you ran out of gas. Like This stuff was strong. <laughs> like, he was wired all the time, and he didn't even do drugs. He just drank Jolt. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, a couple things. Number one, try not to ever say brain dump again. <laughs> and number two, um, yeah, I hate it. When, I hate it when that happens when you wake up and you can't go back to sleep. I'm pretty tired too. But but you know what? I'm excited about what we got coming up. This this topic this topic. Uh, you had texted me last week. Said you want to do a little baptism thing. Not have an actual <laughs> baptism. That would make it for um, an interesting podcast. <laughs> Can I sprinkle some coffee on you? That's all I have. Um, I mean, you already have a coffee stain on your head. But Oh, wow. I feel like I'm meeting with the Russians today. So, but like, so you, you texted me this, and I was like, okay, this is interesting. We'll talk about it. But I hear you had a little, an almost a baptism story of a different kind. It involved a porta potty. Oh, yeah. So yesterday um, we were doing a, uh, doing a job in a neighborhood, and it's a brand new neighborhood, so they're building houses all around. Um, and before we started the job, I ran into the porta potty, and it was super windy here yesterday. Um, so we went on, I finished, we went on about the, our job, and when we came out from um, the house we were working on, the porta potty had blown over and down the street. Like, can you imagine if that would have, oh, can you imagine how funny that story would be had you been in the porta? Yeah, maybe for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't. I wouldn't have found it very. I mean, eventually, I would have laughed about it. You know, a year later when I finally right. smelled better. A little, but, little too soon, right now, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Well, so today I think you're right. We do have an interesting topic. So we have the, the uh, topic on baptism because I had sent you an article a few days ago about a Catholic priest who apparently had been doing baptisms wrong for. Decades. Long time. Yeah, several, 20-some years, 30 years, something like that, um, which evidently, according to the Catholic Church, causes all kinds of issues and 
whether the baptisms were actually legitimate and did they then have the right to partake in other sacraments and so forth. And I want to get into that article because there's definitely some obvious thoughts on that. But um, before we kind of really dive into that article a little bit, I thought maybe we would talk a little bit about baptism and what is baptism, um, maybe a little bit of the history of baptism and how um, you know it might differ from, say, Protestant to Catholic or denominations or something like yeah. that. So, um, Yeah. Well, okay, so baptism has a really rich... The history of it has there's just so many different uh, branches and roads that that history takes. So um, it would be hard to hit all that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna jump forward. Well, I'll start by saying that at baptism was something that was instituted in the New Testament, right? But I want to jump forward to like the 1500s because in Europe there was a group of people that believed that infant baptism wasn't necessary. Okay, and the Catholic Church, of course, was all all about infant baptism. Well, they said this isn't what we believe that the Bible teaches. So their enemies, the people that disagreed with what they were teaching, started naming them uh, Anabaptist. Okay, so this was actually a derogatory term. Anabaptist, I guess the prefix "ana" is is essentially means re, like again. So they were rebaptizers because people would grow up that had been baptized as children and they would be rebaptized as an adult after they came to saving faith in Christ. Okay. Okay, fine. The problem is this topic has been so divisive in the church that the Catholic Church and some others that were not necessarily Roman Catholic, but that were against the Anabaptist movement, some Protestant uh, denominations were so upset over this that in 1526, I believe it was, a decree was issued, um, and there was a guy named Ulrich Zwingli. I don't know if you've ever heard that mm-hmm. name before. Um, but the consensus was, if you're not going to do baptism the way we think you should, then we're going to show you. And what they did was they executed these people, and can you guess by what means they executed them? Drowning. Drowning. They drowned them. And so, I mean, we're not talking like this has just been like a small difference between denominations. This has caused people their lives. This is like a really, it's a really big deal. And so over this day, over the centuries, it has just, it's, there's just people that's been on opposite ends of the spectrum. Some people don't even believe it's for today. Other people like the Catholic church was a very extreme on the issue, believes that you have to have it in order to remove your original and personal sin that you're culpable for. So I mean, there's just a whole array of of thoughts on this. And the history is just, that part of the history actually kind of gets me riled up a little bit. Because I'm like, how can you claim to follow Christ and yet somebody disagrees with you on an issue like baptism or anything for that matter to the point where you're going to drown them? Now, there have been people that I've baptized that I've thought about holding their head underwater, but I actually never went through it, through with it. But it, it just blows my mind, man. I won't make you name names. But, no. um, it's good I didn't baptize you. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, the um, so a little bit of history research I did on this. Um, I read some places that it really kind of started all the way back to the Hebrews in the desert. That I mean, this kind of this ritual of cleansing with water before being able to enter the tabernacle or perform certain things. Um, so the cleansing with water is not. I mean, this has been around for a long, long, long time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I was talking more about the institution that that the New Testament Church, how we do it now. But you're right. Now, the Old Testament, I think the bigger deal with the Old Testament was probably circumcision with the Hebrews, and I feel like in the New Testament, like baptism, kind of in some people's mind, kind of takes the place of circumcision that was used in the Old Testament. Uh, but you're right, the use of water in rituals is is definitely uh, pre, pre-Christ, pre I mean, you know, pre-Christianity, it's, it is definitely was used in the temple worship and the tabernacle in the wilderness. And there's varying ways in which baptism takes place, right? So I think there's, there's pouring, there's sprinkling, there's a immersion. immersion. Um, now, I understand that, of course, when Christianity was new, you know, a couple thousand years ago, it was a lot of adult converts 
Um, but as this kind of original sin theory kind of took hold a little bit, that's when the Catholic Church kind of started with the infant baptism, so that in case something were to happen uh, to your child before they're old enough to make their own decision or whatever, that they're kind of covered, so to speak, their salvation's covered. Um, so for the Catholic Church, it's you know a big, big part of their necessary for salvation, where... Mm-hmm. And in some Protestant denominations, but for a lot of people, it's more of a requirement. So, you mean requirement after you? Yeah, like more of like a, a requirement for, like a, like a almost like a rite of passage. Yeah. Um. So that so obviously this is you can't ask that. So I have a couple questions on this. Um, and welcome to the you can't ask that podcast today. If you uh, enjoy our banter back and forth and what we talk about, please feel free to like, subscribe, follow, uh, wherever you get your podcast. Um, We certainly appreciate uh, any comments that you want to make or questions that you have that you want to put in the comment section. Maybe we can do an episode on that as well. Um, But so one of the questions I have, so what does the Bible for, let's start there. What does the Bible say about baptism in regards to salvation? Man, this is a tough one, and it's not tough necessarily because I don't know what I believe on it. Because I believe I believe what I you know what the Bible teaches that baptism is. There's no requirement for sal- for for to be baptized in order to have that regeneration experience. Um, but people would disagree with me on that. There is a passage of scripture that comes out of Mark chapter sixteen. And some of the earliest and the best texts that we have do not include this passage of Scripture. So I think that's something that we need to note. But in it, Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Right after that, he says, he that does not believe will be damned. So it's like some people read that and say that he that believes and is baptized, like this is part of the belief process. You know, you have to have both belief and baptism. I don't necessarily believe that's what Christ was was teaching at all because you have to take the Bible as a whole. And I think throughout Scripture we're taught that baptism is an ordinance. It's a, it's a commandment that Jesus gave. He told the disciples to go and to baptize people, right? But it's simply more, as we said, a rite of passage to show people, to show people, hey, I'm a Christ follower now. And there's symbolism there, and we can talk about that in a minute. So, but so, but as far as salvation goes, it's not; those two aren't connected. It's not connected as a requirement. It's connected as a subsequent experience that we have after saving faith. And we see that in 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 the book of Acts, there was a eunuch, and uh, Philip met up with him, and and they came across some water. They were talking about the scriptures together, and Philip shared with him what some passages meant out of Isaiah, and they came across some water, and the guy's like, well, what? Okay, so here's some water. Can I be baptized? And Philip's response, I think, it goes a long way in helping our theology with this. He says, if you believe with all your heart, then yes, you may. But if you don't, then no, you can't, because then you'll you'll view this baptism experience as, well, you're good to go, but you're not, because there's no heart belief, you know? Uh, to whereas the Catholic Church, and I think the Lutherans to a point, but not as much as the Catholic Church, they believe that the act of baptism brings about regeneration and removes sin from people. Okay. Was that, did I answer the question? Yeah. Um, well, so so in, my, in, my, in my estimation, no, the Bible does not say you have to be baptized to be saved. So this, um, so let's talk about this article for a minute. Okay. So, because this article kind of contradicts that, right? Yeah, big time. So essentially, what happened, and this was funny because when I sent you this article, I sent it, I found it on one of my news feeds that are really geared towards more Christian history type thing, and then all of a sudden this story kind of picked up steam, and I saw it then on like Fox News and USA Today, and it kind of got some national attention. But so. This priest really used, replaced one word during the baptism, and because of this, it null and voids these baptisms according to the Catholic Church. So basically, the priest was saying 
we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, instead of saying, I I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, it kind of talks a little bit about that in one of the articles, but, I mean, even if you, first of all, I mean, I'm just going to state the obvious. This is silly. I mean, I just think it's silly because we or I now all of a sudden there's an issue here. But because if you believe in the Trinity, then we would totally fit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I think that their, their reasoning is I is supposed to be Jesus is baptizing you. That's what it's supposed to reflect. But at the same time, we is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's three and one, one and three. So you can use the word we. Yeah, that, actually, I had a little bit different understanding of it. When he said I baptize, when he said we baptize you, in effect, according to this article, um, which was entitled Invalid Baptisms, a Catholic Explainer about the facts and the fears. So this is coming, obviously, from a, a Catholic perspective. And when he said, we baptize you, um, it says, in essence, and I lost my place here. Let me find Oh, in, in effect, saying we baptize tries to baptize someone in the name of the community is where the confusion comes in. So who is the baptizer here? Well, it's too vague, he said. He or she, whoever wrote this article, CNA, whoever that is. So by Kevin Jones. So Kevin says that um, it's too vague to say we. You have to say I because I guess I guess the priest, you know, the Catholic Church is all about th- authority, you know, and so I guess the priest is the one that has the authority to baptize. And when he says we, you know, you and that mouse in your pocket, like who else has the authority to baptize? These people, you nobody, right? So you have to be a pre. So yeah, I read this article and I agree with you. It's silly, but that's being nice, Clay. You're being really nice. This I'm not going to be so nice when I talk about this. Okay. I'm just going to warn you. I'm not going to be nice because this got me fired up, man. Well, it, I mean, this is ridiculous. It, it is ridiculous, especially for an organization. And I'm just going to state the obvious: that's been kind of wrapped up in scandal for a long time. Yeah. You know, for this to be kind of a big deal to them. Like and yet they're wanting to cover up some other things. Like, uh, yeah, I have a kind of aggravates me um, quite a bit. But so now, but evidently because of a result of this, all these people that this priest and this priest resigned over this. But because of all of the people that he had baptized this way over the years, their baptism was essentially null and void. You know, um, they should not have been able to partake in other sacraments of Catholic tradition. So Alec actually brought up a good point this morning. So what happens if because all these people are now going to have to be rebaptized? What if you're what if you died and you were administered last rites or whatever? So like now all of a sudden, like if you're a family member, if you're a true Catholic believer and you had a family member who's baptized by this guy and then he's died, now, now are you worried about your family member now being in hell because the baptism wasn't correct? I mean that's kind of a Seems like kind of a harsh kind of result of misplacement of one word, you know? I mean, yeah, unless there's some sort of uh, Catholic doctrine about being baptized for people that are dead. Because I know that people that are in like purgatory, I guess you can pray them out of purgatory or, you know, I, you know, I never had the opportunity to go to purgatory. The week. (laughs) The week we studied uh, the catechism, I was off the school. (laughs) Yeah. So I don't know. So there may be some sort of allowance for that. Either way, yeah, of course you're going to worry about that, right? But but if it's symbolic, isn't it the intent of the? Isn't it the intent behind the actual action that kind of matters? That I mean, the intent is the same whether the word was. The- I agree, but to them, it's not symbolic. To them, it is actually the act of baptism is what brings about regenerative power. To you and me, it's symbolic, right? You are buried with Christ, so you go in the water. You're raised with him into new life, so you come up out of the water. So it's like a, it's like a grave. It, essentially, a water baptism, the water represents a grave. You go in the water, you come back up like you went into the grave and you've risen from the dead. And so to us, it is symbolic, absolutely. To them, it's more than symbolism. It's like the thing, you know? 
Well, so then this brings up an interesting question about salvation then, because now I remember at my mom's funeral, my mom had requested an, an invitation be done at her funeral, and we can kind of talk about invitations and altar calls a little bit later, but you had mentioned there that it's easy as ABC, and you kind of had this little thing. So when you're teaching salvation to your congregation, what is involved in that? What What is required to be sa- saved and to have salvation in your denomination and in your church? What is required just to have the born-again experience? Yes. Um, Romans 10, 9, and 10. That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the thief on the cross, the thief on the cross, I think this came up in one of our conversations. We have no record of him ever being baptized. But when he looks over to Jesus, Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. So I think that's one of the clearest examples of somebody that died who never ever had the opportunity. And it wasn't even an issue. It wasn't a sticking point with Jesus, nor should it be with us. Now, I'm not saying it's not important. Um, I do think sometimes we put uh, uh, too much of an emphasis on it because I've asked people, oh, you know, when did you get saved? Now, I understand that's a churchy word, saved. Okay, we say saved. When did you become a Christ follower? But, you know, and a lot of times people will say, oh, well, I got baptized when I was 10. Well, that wasn't my question. As an old pastor that I used to know used to say, if you go into the water for baptism, a sinner, a dry sinner, you're just going to come up a wet sinner. Like, it's not going to change what's in your heart. And so I think we got to be careful to put too much emphasis on it. But it is also special. So I'm kind of like right in the middle. I don't want to disregard it because it is a commandment. But at the same time, I want us to be careful that when, when the question is asked, are you know are you born again is one phrase that, that Jesus used. you got to be born again. Or are you a Christ follower? Are you saved? When we ask that question, what we're asking is, when did you have come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Regardless of baptism, that's not even a part of that question when I ask it. So that's what we teach in the Nazarene Church, that baptism is important, but it's not the means of salvation. Well, so because the way I understand salvation, right, there's nothing... We can't earn our way to heaven. We can't earn our salvation. We have to admit that we were a sinner. We have to believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he resurrected. Um, and by believing uh, through faith and grace, we're, we're saved. Mm-hmm. So by the emphasis being put, say in this article, on the action of the priest or the process of being baptized, and our salvation is actually dependent on things we are doing, mm-hmm. which I believe is wrong. Okay. Yeah, I agree. It's antithetical to everything that Scripture teaches. Now, I'm coming from a Protestant Bible. You know, I'm not speaking from, because I know Catholics do have their own Bible. But the Scripture makes it very clear, for by grace you're saved through faith, not of works. And if you put this emphasis on baptism that it brings about a regenerative experience, then you're saying it's the action, it's the work of baptism, not the belief. Let me tell you, so I told you this got me fired up. So let me let me go on my rant for a minute. Can sure. I do that? All right. So I was thinking about this. They're thinking about this article. And if I if I if I'm a Catholic and I was in this group of people that had gotten baptized, can I tell you what I'm gonna do? Because this the Catholic Church teaches that baptism is the kind of the end-all, be-all. Like, if you're baptized as a kid, if you're baptized as an adult, when you have this <clears throat> baptism experience that you are, you are entering into the kingdom of God, right? Like, this is a big deal in the Catholic Church. Like, this lays the foundation for them. But yet you're telling me your priests don't know how to do it right? Like, if this is so important to your whole religion... Why aren't you spending one whole year with your priest teaching them exactly the formula to use? Why did it take 30 years to catch on to that he was doing it wrong? Exactly, exactly, (laughs) right? So I would be beyond livid if I was a Catholic in this particular parish. I would be upset. So here's what happens, okay? Oh, we've got a baptism planned for, 
for me, right, for this day. And it's the day that I'm going to be baptized into the Catholic Church, that I'm going to have all my sins washed away, that my original sin is going to be gone, my personal sin will be forgiven. This is a big deal. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go buy a brand new suit. I'm going to spend some cheese on a brand new suit. My wife's going to go buy, this is obviously an analogy, you know, rhetoric here. My future wife would go buy her brand new dress, got some bling going on. We're buying some jewelry. We're inviting our family. We're inviting our friends. We're inviting our coworkers. Hey, man, this is a big deal. We got a party planned afterwards. We're spending food for catering. We're having people over. It's going to be a big deal, right? They're putting all this money all this time, all this energy and excitement, and they're putting in a willingness to participate in this whole process, right? So that's where the heart comes in. They're willing to participate. And you're telling me that a technicality from we saying we instead of I has ruined this whole thing? No, that's not going to fly, dude. I would be so beyond livid, it would not even be funny. Like, it just doesn't even make sense to me. So I hear you, I've, I've already decided. Here's what I would do. So if you are impacted by this somehow, some way, here's what I would do if I were you. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going into the parish, right? I'm going to walk into the parish. I'm going to find that priest. Him and I are going to go to the back office, and we're going to have a little chit chat. As a matter of fact, I'm going to find two priests. Okay, I'm going to grab them by their priestly little godly collars. I'm going to be knocking some heads together. I'm getting on their desk, Clay. I'm dropping elbows. I'm pulling out all my wrestling moves. Some <laughs> knees are going to be flying. Sizzling, high-flying, razzle-dazzle, body-slamming, butt-kicking is going to be going on in this parish. I would be so livid. And then you know what I do? I tell them every dime that I gave to your organization, from the minute you baptized me up until now, I want it back with interest. Well, if I'm not a member of the church, I guess, you know, I Ex technically shouldn't have been giving you exactly. my... Exactly. I was given under false pretenses and interest because of we got to keep up with inflation, right? You know what else I'm doing? I'm bringing my lawyer with me, and I'm going to get that money. And then when we settle out of court, I'm going to my final act is I'm going to tell the Roman Catholic Church to shove it. That would be how... That's how impassioned I am about this. And you would go join Carthage Church. Church of the Nazarene. <laughs> <clears throat> We're really friendly people at the Buffett's <laughs> Church. But so you said something there in there that you said, um, and I love the passion, by the way, but you said something in there about that they were being baptized into the Catholic Church. Yes. Protestants also kind of have a requirement, a lot of Protestant denominations, of being baptized into the church. Like your membership into the church is dependent on you being baptized in the faith. So this is a question that my wife has because my wife is a very shy person. Like to do the baptism in front of everyone is a big, big deal for her because she's, she's the wallflower. She's not the centerpiece. She does not want to be seen, be heard, you know. So I can relate to that. I, even as a pastor, I can understand. So her question is, why is it harder for me to become a member of a church than it is to get into heaven? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Are you asking me that question? Yes, I'm asking you that question. Well, so I thought about this because you had also mentioned this. I've done a lot of thinking. Like, no wonder I couldn't sleep last night, right? <laughs> So the, the truth is this. To be a Christian, you're right. All you have to do is to say, I accept Jesus as my Savior. Okay. Which afterwards, then you should be baptized as a commandment to follow the commandments of Christ. But it has no bearing on your relationship with him. Um, so my answer to that is, is after you have the basics, the foundation, which is Jesus and him crucified, and that's what Paul said. He said, when I go to places, I just preach Christ and him crucified. Like, that's the foundation we lay. Once, though, you begin to build on that foundation, you have all kinds of different denominations, right, obviously. And the reason denominations have come about, some of it has been because of doctrinal differences. Yes, agreed. I'll take a passage of Scripture and I'll read it. You'll take the same passage of Scripture, you'll read it, and I'll say, you know, I think it means this. You say, no, nah, I think it means that. 
And it could be something big enough to where it might actually impact the way we do church. So you're like, well, we can't do church together. And I'm like, no, we can't. So we go do our own thing, right? Next thing you know, we have two new denominations. But there's also more to it. There's the governmental structure. Some denominations say, you know what, just come to our church for a month, you'll be a member. The Nazarene Church doesn't do that. We want people to be more thoughtful about becoming a member of the Nazarene Church because with membership comes the benefits of of being able to vote and have an input into various business aspects of the church. So there, there's more to it. When you talk about being a Christian, yes, it is very simple. But when you're talking about now the body of Christ that is also now an organization, more goes into it than just, oh, I believe in Jesus. Um, you know, there's other responsibilities that come with being a part of a local community. And I think that's where that's where membership comes in, and you have to consider more things. That's the great thing about Christianity. You don't have to consider all these things to be a Christian, to follow Christ. But if you're going to throw your support, your money, your attendance, your talents, and your time, and a host of other things, you know, uh, toward a particular local church, then you at least want to know that the way they do things uh, is kind of more in agreement with maybe the personality of the church kind of lines up more with your personality. Um, so these are things to consider. That's why there has to be more thought, or let me not thought, there has to be more steps in becoming a member than to becoming a, a, just a Christ follower, which I think is actually a good thing because it tells, it reminds us of how easy it is See, we're looking at it as, oh, this is a bad thing, right? Because now i got to go through the hoops to join a denomination. But I see it as a good thing because that's also a reminder of how easy it is to follow Christ, like to become a Christ follower, to get saved, right? You don't have to jump through all these hoops. And let me say this. It's not that we, as a, the Nazarene church, we'll use that as an example. It's not that we have a bunch of hoops that we, that we want you to jump through. It's that we just have a certain way we do things, and we want you to be take thoughtful time and consideration that you're in agreement and that you will help in that process and not try to uh, you know, cause problems and stuff. So I think it's more th that's more the issue than, you know, than I, maybe that's what she's talking about. I'm not sure. I, you know, she said it to you, and you're passing it along, but I don't know. Does that make sense? No, I can see it from that angle, and I, I think um, maybe, and some churches are better at it than others, a way of maybe explaining why it's important or why it's part of their process. Um, and I think we can kind of get into that. Um, I think we're probably pushing close to 30, 40 minutes here, so we'll probably wind this episode down. And on the next one, I want to pick up back with um, – you know, maybe where baptism's role in the church should be. Okay. I kind of talk about maybe um, a little bit of, I, I want to touch on altar calls and invitations. Okay. Um, so I think that will make it for an interesting episode. But, dude, I love I, I love you getting fired up over this. This is I did. Uh, this is Let me sh you want to see how fired up I got? <laughs> Let me show you what I brought with me. I actually brought my luchador mask. <laughs> This is what I would put on when I walked inside. Let's see. I don't even know how it goes on. Right. <laughs> and it don't fit either, but that doesn't matter to me. This is how I would go in right here, baby, and give a Ric Flair, woo, after I did oh, some butt stomping. So. Uh, we just found out why he's not married right now. <laughs> <laughs> really? I resigned from this podcast. Uh, well, you it's don't get your money back. <laughs> All right, well, let's just stop right You'll there. You'll be here and go on to the next lawyer. episode. All right, till next time. All right, man. <laughs> <laughs>